Thank you for once again having the pleasure of being in Krakow, albeit only virtually. I want to talk to you about three mysteries of the concrete world. The abstract world, like the world of mathematics and logic and properties, has its mysteries, but the ones I want to talk to you are the ones of the concrete world. So, a lot of this talk will be trying to get you to wonder about things. Some of them you have no doubt wondered about already, but perhaps the connection between some of these things was not something you wondered as much about. So, I want to make you wonder about three things. Causation, mind, and normativity. And in each case, I want you to wonder about three different things parts of that mystery. And the first part of each one is that there is such a thing at all, that there is causation, mind, normativity. The second one is that it takes the concrete shape that it does, that it is arranged the way it is. And the third is that we know that it exists and the kind of shape it has, and especially about the second, uh, that we know the kind of shape it has. And I'm going to argue that in all these cases, reductionist views struggle with the mystery and with all of its parts, and have a particular problem with the interconnections between the three different mysteries. And then I will argue that an Aristotelian theism can give an integrated and very satisfying explanation of uh, the three mysteries and can do so in a, an attractive way that neither Aristotelianism on its own can do nor theism on its own can do. So let's think about causation first, right? So I think there we only saw the puzzlingness of this with Hume. So Let's think about this. Imagine a world without causation. There's just one thing after another. That one thing after another, it seems, could be just like our world. It could be the same sequence of things, but without any causation, just one thing after another. Maybe, or maybe not. The reductionists say it couldn't be just like our world. But in any case, why isn't our world one of those worlds without any causation? Here's an obvious answer. Our world has stuff in it, and stuff can't exist without a cause. Fine. But if you think that through, if you think that stuff can't exist without a cause, then you're led down to an infinite regress. That seems vicious. Okay, so standard move at this point. You say, well, okay, well, maybe uh, things divide into two kinds, contingent and necessary. And the contingent ones can't exist without being caused, but we've got contingent ones. So that's why uh, there's causation, because we've got contingent stuff. Well, for one, that seems to be taking uh, things a little backwards, because it seems that uh, the reason we have contingent things is because of causation, not the other way around. Um, but also, this is not going to be an answer that's going to be attractive to a typical atheist. It's going to be at least an answer that pulls in the direction of at least half of my Aristotelian theism, namely the theism part. There are famous attempts to reduce causation. Right? We call these Humean accounts. So Hume had his own account where it's, uh, A's are typically followed by B's. That means A causes B. Uh, we have more sophisticated accounts from David Lewis and others, where we first define laws in terms of uh, the regularities of things, with the laws being the statement of the world in a nutshell, the shortest statement that is highly informative, something that balances informativeness and, um, and brevity. And then laws of nature define counterfactuals, and counterfactuals define causation. So this global mosaic of things one thing after another in a very complex way 
defines causation on this kind of reductive approach. And that's the Armenian reductive approach right now. The problem, I think, with that is that it's excessively extrinsic. Causal relations seem to be a fact between two things. I touch two hands together, that causes me to feel something. That seems to be just a fact about me. But on this Humean picture, it's a fact about the global arrangement of all of the universe. Now, maybe that's not so bad. Maybe they're just counterintuitive and we have to, you know, philosophy is full of counterintuitive things and sciences as well. But I think it's particularly bad in two cases when we think about the interconnection between the various mysteries. So the first part is uh, the next thing I will talk about uh, after causation will be mind. And the main reductive theory of mind that we have is a functionalist theory. And functions are causal things. They are defined by causal relations. If causation is highly extrinsic and global and holistic in nature, so is my mind. So that means that whether I have a mind depends on what happens at far, and, uh, far away parts of the universe. Maybe even, in fact, I think on a standard uh, Lewisian view, definitely, on things that happen in the distant future, because all of those things are part of what defines the laws of nature. And the laws of nature define causation. So that seems wrong. It also seems wrong when you think about ethical normativity. Responsibility doesn't seem like a completely or a so largely an extrinsic feature of reality. It seems to be something about me, my responsibility, and yet my responsibility is tied to causation. It's tied to me causing things to happen. I think the human story also doesn't fully answer the existence problem of why we have causation at all. It shifts it to a shape problem. Why is the shape of, uh, of the arrangement of things as it is so that we have enough regularities in the world? Because if we don't, didn't have enough regularities, there wouldn't be any such thing as causation on the human story. Causal laws appear to be non-supervenient, despite what the Humean says. It seems like you could have a world that's very much like this one, where the same kind of stuff happens, but happens completely by chance. That kind of a world would have very different causal laws, and yet the same Humean mosaic. I also think there are sort of these interesting problems that I've just lately started thinking about for Humean views of laws of nature with the constants in them. Um, a number of the constants in the laws of nature seem to be super messy things. So for example, there's the fine structure constant, which initially people thought was 1 137th. Well, some people actually thought it was exactly that. Um, and we got like an extra decimal point. It was 137.0 next. And they thought, oh, wow, I'm getting there. It really is 1 137th. Oh, but then came another digit, 3. 1, one out of 137.03. And um, unfortunately, at that point, we sort of, the thought that's 1 137th fell apart. And it's probably, though we could be, I could be wrong about that, some kind of extremely messy, infinitely long number. Yet this number is built into the laws of physics. Now, the Humean story that we get from David Lewis is that the laws of nature are a balance of the briefest and most informative, of what is brief and what is informative. Now, a number that is infinitely long, has infinitely many digits, and doesn't have any simple description, is not going to be brief. It's going to be like super uh, long. So it can't enter into the laws of nature. So it seems like the actual value of the fine structure constant cannot be part of the laws of nature. However, it's my understanding that chemistry depends on 
the value of the fine structure constant. If that fine structure constant were significantly other than what it is, chemistry would be radically different. And of course, so would biology. I hope you'll bring this up in the connection with things like fine tuning. But I don't want to do quite that. I want to think about this. I mean, we have laws in chemistry. If the fine tuning constant's value is not included in the laws of nature, then those chemical laws are kind of in trouble, which we're going to sit on top of that. So it seems to me that what we're going to need is we're going to need for the laws of nature to specify not to full precision what the fine structure constant is, because that's infinitely long probably, but to some range. Maybe between this and that. And if we do that, that's a very strange kind of law of nature where it says we've got to have this constant somewhere between this and this. And why between this and why between that? It's, it's very strange. Well, so one of the things about the shape of causation in our world that we already talked about is that it's got constants. It's got numbers in it. Very specific, very precise, specific numbers. That kind of points to a contingency. There doesn't seem to be any reason why it would be these numbers rather than others. But the laws themselves appear to have some contingency. I mean, the laws of space-time. It's a four-dimensional space-time. Why four? Why not five? Why not three? Why not uh, 27? All of these seem like they are real options. And there seems to be something contingent about these laws. They don't seem to be something that just comes out of the fundamental principles of metaphysics. So there's a kind of arbitrariness to it. But this arbitrariness is, of course, very famously, and this is like sort of a lot of standard arguments for theism focus on this part. They're very orderly, right? Nature is very regular. It's got these laws. It's got, I mean, this is always kind of mind-blowing, I think, 10 to the 80 particles at least, enormous numbers of particles. But these 10 to the 80 particles... Um, divide up into only about a hundred different types. And even across types, we've got similarities in their behavior, like conservation laws. Um, more controversially, um, there's higher level causation that the lower level causation is uh, integrated with, the kind of higher level causation we have in mind, for example. And this higher level causation plays nice with lower level causation, though we don't know how. And of course, there's fine tuning, as many of you have talked about. So I think that the shape that causation takes in our world is very strange, very surprising. And so is our knowledge of it. It's a lesson from Hume that recognizing cases of causation, seeing causation, is not at all a trivial thing. It doesn't seem to be directly observable in some kind of very... Um, modern kind of sense of direct observability like uh, uh, we had some modern philosophers talking about. It seem, that seems to be something we've learned from Hume. It might be observable in some sort of humanistic kind of way through observing uh, our behavior or something, but it's, it's really tough to see how we recognize causation in the world and get it right. If we have Humean re reductionism, maybe we can do a little bit better because then it's just a matter of recognizing um, the Humean patterns in the mosaic. But even then, we need to assume that things far away are like they are nearby to know that anything causes anything around here. Because causation around here depends on what happens globally, and that would require knowledge of the uniformity of nature. Second mystery, mind. Now here, it's, there is, here it seems really uncontroversial that it exists. I mean, that's the cogito, right? Uh, which suggests that mindedness is, if anything, more obvious than existence. Um, uh, there are things with minds. But not everything has a mind intuitively, though the panpsychists disagree. Um, and just as causation seems to be important for uh, mind and for ethical normativity, 
Um, mind is obviously important for some things, um, specifically for normativity, uh, many kinds of normativity, epistemic, practical, and of course, ethical. And mind has well-known sort of uh, mysterious global features or mysterious features, intentionality, consciousness, and action. Our best current proposal for a reduction of mind to non-mind is functionalism. So the idea behind functionalism is that what defines mental properties are sort of modules in the mind having certain functions and connections between the modules in such a way that any things that have modules with the same functions and the same connections and have the same inputs and the same outputs are going to think alike, are going to have the same conscious states, the same, rep the same representational states of their environment is the same, um, perform the same intentional actions and so on. So functionalism says that um, we have this idea of a functional isomorphism, which is things that where the modules in the minds and their functions and their connections correspond, and that functional isomorphism implies sameness of mental properties, or at least internal mental properties. This story requires two things. One, obvious causation, and the second, slightly less obvious, but still true, is normativity. Why normativity? Well, a module has a function. A function is what it does properly, normally, right? Modules can malfunction if, it, there's, if the environmental conditions are wrong or if there's internal damage, right? So the modules that define the functions can malfunction, but nonetheless, they have a function. So their function seems to be normatively defined. Now, that's controversial. Some people think you could try to do this statistically or something, or through evolution. Um, I think we can have a discussion of that, um, but I don't think that works. I think it has to be genuinely normative. Also, just as um, the laws of nature, the level of detail we have in them, like the constants, for example, suggests a contingency of the laws of nature, the kinds of laws that functionalism involves, these are laws about what physical systems uh, can be divided up into modules and what kind of modules um, make for mind. Those kinds of laws, these kinds of, let's call them mental laws, have a, are going to have a lot of arbitrariness to them that points to a contingency. So one kind of question is, how complex can functional isomorphisms be? So if you allow extremely complicated functional isomorphisms, where you identify sort of localized uh, modules in one system with sort of global uh, things in another system that under some kind of encoding um, uh, perform the same function, then you can get everything is functionally isomorphic to everything else as long as the system has enough complexity. Um, and then my pointer, uh, much less my, uh, and not just my computer, but my pointer is then thinking the same kinds of thoughts as I do because being an analog, uh, somewhat analog system uh, full, filled with little quantum stuff, um, it's got enough complexity and you could find a really complicated functional isomorphism on which it's running. The uh, vibrations of the atoms in it are running the same software as my mind is, and so it's thinking the same things as I am, in addition to thinking the same things as you are, and we're all thinking the same thoughts. So it's, it's very weird. So it can't be like, there's got to, can't, there, there can't be completely unconstrained uh, isomorphisms. Um, on the other hand, if they're too constrained, then we lose the intuition that you could have two people who think the same thoughts and have the same mind, even though their particles are at least slightly off in their positions. Um, similar question, 
how fine-grained must functional isomorphisms be? So, for example, you have, um, let's say you've got a module in the mind that performs some arithmetical function. Maybe it adds the inputs together to get an output. There are many algorithms by which you could perform that function. Uh, does the isomorphism care about that or not? To what degree does it care? How reliable does a module have to be to implement a function? If it's just completely at random, clearly we don't have any kind of functional module going on. But if it's, what if it's 90% reliable? Is that good enough? Does it have, or maybe 60, maybe 50. How reliable does a mental module have to be to count as a mental module? There's got to be a cutoff here if there is a real difference between mental and non-mental. There's got to be some kind of number there, like a constant in the laws of the mind, a reliability variable or a reliability constant. How much counterfactual robustness must we have? So if a system just functions in only one extremely specific set of inputs, it doesn't have the kind of counterfactual robustness that we associate with a functional system. But on the other hand, every, every ordinary system we know of um, will fall apart if you heat it up enough. So how much robustness to the environment must there be for it to count as uh, a delineated functional system? And how do we divide the system and the environment? The laws of the mind, if they are functional laws, would have to answer all of these questions and answer them with complete specificity, I think. So they would have to be very complex. And it seems like for all of these, the answers seem arbitrary. There's, they point to contingency. Point to, yeah, it could be here, it could be here, these cutoffs between, say, amount of robustness needed. Um, and I don't think that fits well with functionalism. It points to the fact that uh, the mind does not supervene on the physical arrangement of things, on the functional arrangement of things, because we, we cannot really even define this functional arrangement of things without arbitrariness. That said, it seems very plausible to me that some elements of functionalism are true, even if a reduction is not true. That if in some sense there is a ro some robust system that functions very much like mine, it likely thinks thoughts very much like mine. So there's a shape thing um, about the mental laws. Part of the shape of them seems to be a fair amount of contingency and arbitrariness where we have to draw a line between the human brain and my pointer. Um, even though there is going to be some extremely complicated isomorphism between what's going on in these two different uh, analog systems. Uh, there's got to be some arbitrariness there. But at the same time, there's an order, just like in the ordinary laws of nature. Uh, if the laws were too different, the actual physical structure of reality wouldn't result in evolved apes like us having minds. And if there wasn't order in the mental laws, then we couldn't have knowledge of other minds. And yet I take it that we do. And then there's a knowledge question. How do we know which functional systems have minds? Humans and higher mammals at least do probably quite a lot more, and which do not. Protons surely do not. Trees probably do not. We have intuitions that uh, there are behavioral similarities that are highly indicative of mind and behavioral dissimilarities that are highly counterindicative of mind. But why are these intuitions reliable? I mean, it's useful from an evolutionary point of view, to have you know, intuitions as to which things function externally, behavioristically, in a minded kind of way, so we can predict their behavior. But unless behaviorism is true, then uh, that doesn't actually give us any usefulness to predicting whether other things have minds, because minds are not the same as behavior. Possibly some kind of functionalism with coarse-grained isomorphism conditions can do just as well as behaviorism here. Um, 
but how coarse must the grain be? We can get a, one of those arbitrariness problems and an explanation of why functionalism has that it has the cutoffs for its grain level in isomorphism conditions where it does. Normativity. So there's uh, multiple kinds of normativity. Some are more controversial than others. I'll give a quick list from the less to the more controversial. Uh, epistemic, practical, moral, natural, and aesthetic. Right, so uh, epistemic normativity, you know, stuff like uh, don't believe without evidence. Um, that's very uncontroversial and probably part of the reason uncontroversial it is, is because it's so necessary for all of our lives. Everything human falls apart if there's no epistemic normativity. Nothing makes much sense. Um, then there's practical, again, without it really we can't act. We can't even do things like, hey, this conduces to my end, um, so I should do it. <laughs> So what? It conduces to the end if there's no practical normativity. Moral normativity, um, this is more controversial, but without it I say life has no meaning. It's indispensable as well for a real, truly human life. Um, natural normativity, um, by that I mean this kind of notion that's famous in Aristotle, like that sheep ought to have four legs and, you know, human beings ought to be bipeds. Uh, not all sheep have four legs, not all humans have two legs, but that's how it ought to be, this kind of natural normativity, how things ought to be in the realm of nature. That's very controversial, but I think it also gets connect, connects with some of the other mysteries, specifically the mind one. So our best reductionist story on the mind part was functionalism. And functionalism re depended on the notion of function. And I think uh, it's not going to be promising to try to make an account of function without natural norms. This module should work this way, that kind of thing. So it's, it's important uh, to, to functionalist theories of mind. And even if we don't think functionalism is true as a full theory, we think we should, I think we all kind of think it's got something to it in that function is relevant to mind and so this concept of function seems to be one that we need and so we need natural norms. Another thought, uh, sort of something I was thinking about recently, um, there's lots of applications to natural normativity in things like bioethics. Sort of the famous one is uh, uh, going to be the distinction between enhancement and treatment, right? So you think treatment restores natural function, enhancement goes beyond natural function. <laughs> So that, that, that seems like an important distinction, but then people have questioned it. So it's, it's an important distinction, I think, but it's a controversial one. But I think there's some other places where natural normativity comes up. So recently I've been playing with this uh, thought experiment. Um, uh, suppose I have a device that can remotely wiggle the membranes inside your nose, the mucous membranes inside your nose. And I use this machine and I go up to complete strangers on the street, point it at them and turn it on and their mucal membranes are wiggling and they can feel it. I've done something wrong. I should have asked their permission. I mean, it's like touching people. Uh, I mean, I just shouldn't I mean, there are some cases where I can, but there's at least a presumption against touching peop random people, right? Um, uh, without their consent. You know, on a crowded bus, we have kind of implicit consent. We've all got on this crowded bus so we can do it. Um, but uh, no normally, uh, we don't have consent to touch people. Similarly, we don't have consent to wiggle their membranes inside their noses. 
But on the other hand, uh, I have a device, this is not science fiction anymore, where I can wiggle the membranes inside your ears. I'm doing it right now. I'm using this very device. Now, in this case, maybe it's consensual because, you know, I've sort of expected you to agree to come to this talk. But I could just see you on the street and say, hi, or hello, do you have what time, the time? Um, or what is, the, what is the way to the vavel? Right, so I can do, I can do that and you don't have to consent, right? I can just do this to complete strangers and with my voice, I wiggle the membranes inside your ears. So I am permitted to wiggle the membranes in your ears, but not the ones in your nose. What's the difference? Well, I think it's actually a fairly complicated question, but I think there's an ingredient to it that is really intuitive. It's the normal function of the membranes in the ear to be used for communication between people, including between strangers. And it is the normal function of our vocal cords to be used for communication, and in particular for vibrating people's uh, uh, oral membranes in their ears, right? Um, but it is not a proper function. It is not normal for the membranes in our nose to be vibrated remotely by other people for communicative or nefarious or um, jokey uh, purposes. And it seems like uh, when people make an abnormal use of our bodies of this sort, or it's abnormal both on the side of the agent, uh, the person with the device for vibrating nose membranes, and abnormal on the side of the patient, the person whose uh, membranes are being vibrated, um, seems like the difference, it uh, seems like that's wrong and it's unnatural in this way, or at least, uh, you know, prima facie wrong or something like that. I mean, I think if it, if it was required to save someone's life or maybe even to save someone's uh, finger from being cut off, it would be okay for me to vibrate the, the membranes inside your nose without permission, but not just for fun. But on the other hand, I can vibrate the membranes in your ear just for fun. I can come up to, to a stranger and just tell a joke. That's weird if it's a stranger, but weird is not the same as immoral. So I think there's actually a surprising amount in ethics which depends on uh, the difference between the natural and the non-natural and not just in bioethics. The aesthetic is the most controversial, right? It's, it's a lot easier to be a subjectivist about aesthetic normativity or to just be a, an error theorist and just say, ah, we just evolved to, rec to do, uh, to, I don't know, recognize uh, features that correlate with being good mate and then this evolutionarily explained system kind of exploded into spandrels where uh, sunsets and butterflies also count as beautiful and not just uh, uh, possible mates. I don't know how good a story that is, but it seems like it's not that hard to hold on to such a story. It's not that hard to go through uh, a lot of life and just say, okay, well, you know, uh, tastes differ and there's nothing really to a great art that makes it intrinsically greater or better. I mean, I, I don't go do that. I don't think that, but it doesn't seem like it would be completely destructive of human life in the way that, say, uh, not believing in moral normativity and consist living uh, open, you know, clearly with that in mind would be. That said, I think it was one of the uh, great discoveries of the scientific revolution, the meta-discovery in the scientific revolution, that an aesthetic is needed in science. That the fact that a theory is beautiful is evidence for its being true. 
I mean, think of uh, Galileo and his disagreement with the church. Galileo thought that the Copernican system was elegant, simple. I think he had an aesthetic sensibility that it's the kind of system God would put in place. And what people like Cardinal Bellarmine attacked the most, I think, theologically, or had, uh, I think, the most interesting objection, I don't know if the most, but the, had the most interesting objections to, was this idea, this presumption that God's going to do things that way. And that was, I think, I think quite plausibly an aesthetically grounded presumption that Galileo had, that this particular kind of beauty, the elegance of simple laws of nature, in this case, things going around in circles uh, with a very small number of epicycles as compared to the competing theories, um, that that's how likely things are. And I think, uh, I think we can't escape this. I think this is what modern physics, at least, and other sciences are a little more complicated as a story. It's a different aesthetic there, um, but at least the physics has this aesthetic built into it where theories are judged on aesthetic grounds. I mean, what, one of the things about Einstein that made him the successful physicist, incredibly successful physicist he is, is I think he had like a really good feel for the aesthetics of the physical world and what we would expect a world with that kind of beauty to exhibit. I mean, so like in his popular book on relativity theory, he says, you know, he gives this principle of relativity, which is basically a principle of invariance that the laws of nature are the same in every reference frame. He explains it and then just, and then says that, you know, without any empirical confirmation, we have good reason to think this. I think it's actually more than good reason. I'm understating what he says. Um, though, of course, he thought, thought eventually we were going to get empirical confirmation and we got some in his lifetime and he knew he, he does mention that in the book um, but he had this aesthetic sensibility of what the world is likely to be like as for and I think it was an aesthetic one there's an aesthetics behind science and so I think uh, we actually need an objective aesthetics for science as we have we have been doing it in recent centuries Okay. Um, at the same time, I think, just as in the case of the mind, where I said that the main reductionist theory, uh, functionalism, suffered from a lot of arbitrariness, arbitrary cutoffs, constants, that kind of thing, and the laws of physics, which also had a sort of appearance of contingency due to there being constants, particular numbers of dimensions, that kind of thing, um, with normativity, we have this to an even higher degree. There is like, seems to be contingency everywhere. There seem to be like constants or something or cutoffs or weird, weird phenomena like that everywhere if we think about it. And those phenomena make it very unlikely, I think, that we're going to just be able to derive ethics from a, some small number of principles or reduce it to non-ethical phenomena. Because it seems like you could have the non-ethical side of the world be as it is, and the ethical be slightly different, a slightly different cutoffs. Let, let me give some examples, and it's not going to be just ethical, actually. I think this applies to all of normativity, but the ethical is what I thought, have thought perhaps the most about. Um, let me start with the epistemic, which is the most uncontroversial part. So, um, you observe a black raven. You should not conclude from that that all ravens are black. That's too fast. You observe two black ravens. Eh, maybe. That's starting to be less clear. Right? Uh, we may, that you shouldn't. Maybe now it's starting to be at least a good gamble to think all ravens are black. You observe three. A better gamble. Right? At some point it becomes just reasonable once you've observed enough black ravens to think all ravens are black. Maybe when you've observed a million. Now, there's sort of two ways to err from with this, two ways of going wrong. You could, th you could be too cautious epistemically and require, you know, I don't know, 
a trillion ravens. And then you'll never, you know, get to be thinking all ravens are black. Um, or you could be too much of an epistemic risk taker and think one black raven's enough. Or maybe even just one raven uh, that kind of looks slightly blackish. Uh, maybe that's enough, right? That does, that's no good. Uh, now, I don't know whether there's like some specific number where at that number of black ravens, everybody should think all ravens are black. But I, I do know there are, numbers, there, are, there are numbers of ravens where it's unreasonable to think all ravens are black and numbers where it is reasonable. And so there's going to be some sort of cutoff between uh, unreasonable and then some kind of middle area, perhaps, or perhaps just one specific number in the middle area where, where it becomes reasonable and then where it's more than reasonable, as it were. Where every, so there's some kind of area where reasonable people maybe could disagree or maybe there isn't such an area. But in any case, between that and believing that uh, and everybody having to think all ravens are black, there's going to be some kind of cutoff of once you've got enough evidence there, everybody should think it. And below that, there should be a cutoff where nobody should think that. Where do these cutoffs come from? Why must they be what they are? Again, they, they don't seem like, it's not in the mathematics of probabilities or something like that. They don't like, uh, numbers don't just, like that just show up. It seems something arbitrary here as to where exactly these are, but not completely arbitrary because it's, it's like in a, a reasonable range. It fits with our lives. Um, practical normativity. Um, you know, uh, people vary as to how risk averse they are. I think there's a range of attitudes of risk aversion that are reasonable, but there's such a thing as being too risk averse and too little risk averse, or uh, too risk averse and not risk averse enough. And again, where do these num where do these lines lie, or what makes them be where they are? It's puzzling. Um, on the moral side, I've been collecting lots of examples. Let me give a few. Um, the first one I actually came across uh, was from Aquinas. And Aquinas says that you should prefer those closer to you to those further away from you. So you've got kind of preferentiality in Aquinas' ethics. And I think that's clearly right. And so he gives this example, right? You should, you should uh, benefit your father over a stranger when the benefits are equal. But what if the benefits are not equal? What if it's a matter of a slightly higher benefit to a stranger and a slightly lower one to their father? A utilitarian will say, well, benefit the stranger, all other things being equal. But the utilitarian is just wrong about that, I think. Um, I think we should still benefit the parent, even if it's a slightly smaller benefit to a parent. But at some point, the benefit to a stranger, if we increase the benefit to a stranger while keeping constant the benefit to the parent, our duty will shift and we'll have to benefit the stranger. And Aquinas thinks that that is true. What makes that shift happen where it does? Um, or another thing um, that I've been thinking a lot about, the principle of double effect it seems to be like one of those really neat and simple uh, to formulate initially principles, sort of elegant. There's a kind of elegance to it. And it seems to explain a bunch of phenomena until you think through a bunch of cases. And then you just sort of ethicists uh, like me just pull their, who are attracted to it, just start pulling their hair out. Um, so you think about things like, okay, uh, it's okay to bomb the enemy headquarters. Um, uh, even though that'll kill civilians on the street because you don't intend the deaths of the civilians on the street, but you do intend um, the destruction of the headquarters. But what if you're dropping bombs on the enemy headquarters to make people think that you're aiming to kill civilians, to make them think that you're a ruthless and hence they should surrender? Your intention is not to kill civilians. Your intention is to drop bombs in a place which will make people think you're the kind of person who would kill civilians. 
and that happens to be a place which has civilians. But it's not the deaths of the civilians that make them think that. It's maybe they are only observing from a distance through binoculars, and then they surrender when they see how ruthless you are. Uh, that's a ridiculous case, but it has been discussed in the literature. And then there's going to be sort of lots of intermediate kinds of cases. It gets, the cases get very weird. And the more I think, when I started thinking about double effect, I thought, there's going to, there's got to be some nice way to systematize all this. And I've stopped thinking this. I, I'm starting to think there may not be a good way to systematize it. It may be that there's a whole bunch of things um, where some are closer to intentional killing, some are further, and then there's just some cutoff there where the ones that are too close to intentional killing of the innocent are wrong, those further are not, and it's just there isn't a simple rule that gives this. And in all these cases, the epistemic, practical, moral, um, in all these cases, it seems to me that when we think about these kinds of cutoffs between cases, it makes it seem like the norms do not just supervene on some sort of general rule plus the, uh, the non-normative structure of reality. It seems like we could have the same non-normative structure of reality and a slightly different rule from what it, wherever it is and would work just as well. So there's a kind of contingency that I think does not fit with a reductive story. In fact, does not fit with a Kantian story either is interesting. On the side of normativity, there's also this interesting correlation with the other uh, things I've talked about. There's a correlation between the norms, the causal capabilities of the things that the norms apply to, and the environment. For instance, we're typically not required to do what is impossible or even what is nearly impossible. In fact, there's also Within normativity, there's a kind of correlation. The different kinds of um, normativity play nice together, by and large. Not in every case, but by and large, they tend to go together. Uh, epistemic, uh, obeying epistemic nor norms tends to make you somewhat a better person. Uh, or at least disobeying them is apt to make you a worse person, morally speaking. Um, morality requires you to get to know the world and to follow the epistemic norms. Uh, the practical norms are behind all of this stuff as well. They're all interconnected. They flourishing with respect to one set of norms tends to go together with respect to the other. We talk of a beautiful life, and that would be a life of epistemic and moral uprightness. So the aesthetic goes along as well. That's a puzzling thing, the shape of all these norms which do not reduce to non-normative features of reality, happens to be so well correlated. And then there's this big puzzle that much has been written on how we know these norms. How do evolved apes get so much right? Um, we certainly are not just deriving these norms from a few basic principles, because a lot of these norms don't seem to derive from them in any clear way from any clear principles that we all agree on, because we don't agree on them. But we agree on a lot of cases. How do we get them right? Okay. So, we have some problems. We have a, a degree of contingency in the realms of causation, mind, and normativity, which makes these realms seem independent of the non-causal, non-mental, and non-normative, respectively, aspects of reality. A kind, some kind of independence, but not a complete independence. It's not completely disconnected. It's not like uh, chairs have minds and we have duties to jump uh, to the moon, right? There is a connection between the, uh, the, these, the norms and the rest, and there's a connection between the minds and the rest and the cause and the rest. Um, given the contingency, we realize in some sense, in principle, these re three realms could come apart, and now we wonder why they don't, why they, they are so integrated. I think there's a kind of Aristotelian story about all this uh, to be told that I find attractive. The norms governing things are grounded in their natures, and their natures are a metaphysical component of them that has both a causal and a normative element, and in the minded things, the, the forms are even ground the minds. 
But there's a contingency here because we could have had critters with other natures than the ones we have. But at the same time, while we have contingency, the norms are not an alien imposition. The norms on us come from within ourselves, and our causal structure comes from within ourselves, from our form. There's nothing very attractive, um, both from a philosophy of science point of view, from a normative theory point of view, with this idea of some kind of certain kind of autonomy that we have, um, causally, normatively, and even mentally, right? It's not a holism. It's a, like my mind is grounded in my form. But the second part of the Aristotelian story that Aristotle does give is that things tend to go right. There's a tendency in nature for things to behave in accordance with the norms and hence to, for, the, for the kinds of things that have minds to get to the truth. There's an optimism in Aristotelianism. And this optimism does not have a good explanation in the Aristotelian system. But theism, of course, gives an explanation. So if you add to this Aristotelian the system a theistic story where God freely made rational and non-rational beings harmonizing their causal, normative, and mental natures, harmonizing all these things, then it starts to make sense why we would have the kind of optimism that we, that, or why the kind of optimism behind Aristotelianism is true. And I think this kind of story predicts both there being order and harmony, as well as there being a kind of appearance of arbitrariness because the things that are being harmonized are so innately complex. And so they're hard to, hard to harmonize. It's just like it's hard to write laws about taxation. And so the laws about taxation have a complexity, but some kind of order. Not enough, but some kind of order. So Aristotelianism on its own that leaves the optimism unexplained. Theism without Aristotelianism is apt to make the various features seem like alien impositions. Creationism, in the case of minds, which may be um, divine command theory, in the case of norms, occasionalism, in the case of causation. All of these things sort of pull the mysteries out away from us, but they are in us. And so I think an Aristotelian theism does just, much better justice. Thank you.